The Lord be with you all. Parables, riddles, and proverbs. These kinds of sayings that we have in Scripture that are not straightforward. This is our context for today. I'm going to focus the sermon and um, my reflections on Ezekiel 17. Now, we only read verses 22 to the end for the reading in the lectionary. But the whole chapter is a long allegory or three maybe parables built into a long lesson that Ezekiel teaches. And then I'll um, compare it with um, Mark chapter 4 verses 26 to 34 where Jesus has two parables again. But we focus on this idea of parables and riddles because of the way these two passages begin. Ezekiel 17 1 says, The word of the Lord came to me, propound a riddle, Speak in a parable to the house of Israel. Now, the passage that we read in Ezekiel is picked up. We'll see this in Mark chapter 4. And Mark records this at the end of the parables in the chapter. With many such parables, he spoke to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his disciples, he explained everything. Now, on our way into looking at these proverbs and these riddles, allegories in the chapter, um, we ought to, if you're not already, asking yourselves, why does God communicate in this way? You know, why these parables, why allegories, why stories, why complex proverbs? St. Augustine wrote a little book on scripture in the fourth century. And in there, he asks this question. It's a natural one. Why are some parts of scripture so difficult? And he says, God has made some things in Scripture plain, so that we'll simply know what to do, what to follow. Now, the Lord's reign, we know. God tells us, do not steal, do not kill, do not commit adultery. There are plain things that allow us to live, that tell us who the Lord God of the universe is. But then Augustine says he's also giving us many puzzling things. Some nearly impossible, some riddles, some enigmas. And he does this for a couple of reasons. He does it to satisfy our desire for learning. Um, he reflects that God has built into us that desire to solve puzzles, to fix and um, intuit challenges. And we like to look into scripture and say, what does it mean? These are the kinds of things and the way that we've been wired. But the second thing about these kinds of proverbs and riddles and uh, parables is that they are shaping, they're formative when we read them, in the way that we work through them. Think, for example, of this proverb. One pretends to be rich and yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor and has great wealth. There's no, there's no simple application to that. There's no obvious example that it's drawn from. There are those who pretend to be great but have nothing. And there's there um, reflections, there's insights about appearances. But there's also reflections on virtue, on those who are rich but pretend not to be, on what is more important in life. And so there's this kind of whole spectrum of ideas and insights um, laid up in a single proverb. Uh, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 2 says, Desire without knowledge is not good. And one who hastens with his feet misses the way, or sins, is maybe translated. Desire. So now here's a more specific kind of reflection on the power of desire. If it's not guided by, if it's not disciplined by learning. Those who run only with their heart's intent, which is often popular in our culture, often miss the way. And so this proverb, you can feel it in your bones. It stills you to give reflection to your steps, to your ways, the things that we do. Uh, Proverbs in chapter 30 says, there are four things that are small and yet they are wise. The ant, the rock badger, the locust, and the lizard. And it gives reflections on why. There are these observations that are shaping to us as we imagine how God's ordering of the world can come to bear and give um, light to our path that we live day to day. And so as I lead us into these, there is discipline to be had in reading the Proverbs and the parables in these riddles. 
I should add to this, um, Marianne Wolf, she's one of uh, more than one, uh, uh, several neuroscientists over the last couple of decades that have been looking at the way and what we read and how it shapes us as people. So we can actually point to evidence in neuroscience that those who read novels and poetry and read stories and allegories um, find higher empathy with others in real life because they've met other characters of great diversity. And we can now contrast that to the emotions and to the empathy formed by somebody who takes their information in through electronic media and social media. Forms of reading, ways that form us. So this first section is Ezekiel chapter 17, and the Lord has told Ezekiel to tell a parable. So this seems to be um, Ezekiel's own literary creation. And we start in verse 22 in the reading for the lectionary, but the beginning actually goes back in verses 2 and 3. And Ezekiel says that there is a great eagle who's come and taken a sprig from the top of a grand cedar and planted it, and it's sprouted and made a vine that's begun to grow. And there's another great eagle, and the vine begins to grow towards that eagle. And as Ezekiel goes on, he says later that that vine withers. Will it not wither? Will not the Lord draw it up and pull it out by its roots? And he says then that the, the two eagles are those of Babylon and Egypt. Babylon, the empire, the wealthy empire that's entered in, that Israel has often coveted. And then Egypt, that nation, when Israel is finally being taken captive, that they fall and call upon to help them in a day of need. And the Lord says, will I not rip out that root and destroy that vine? And will it not wither on the, on the branch? And then he says at the end of the passage, which is our reading today, that he'll pull another sprig from the top of a great cedar and he'll plant it by waters and he'll water it and it will grow into a tree that will welcome all the birds of the earth. You know, maybe this uh, remnant of a scene from Noah, there's going to be a gathering of nations, of peoples, of the goodness of the world to this sprig that's being built up. And the image for Ezekiel is a restarting of Israel's kingdom, which is in demise, which is running into exile. If there are two lessons to take from this uh, brief parable in Ezekiel 17, the first of many lessons would be simply that there is always mercy in judgment. Of the reason that Israel has been carried away into Babylon and then into Assyria in punishment, into exile, is because God promised it if Israel remained unfaithful and did not repent. For kings built up great wealth. They forsook the needy, the widow, the orphan, the immigrant. They were unjust. They turned to other gods. They relied on Egypt in their wars. And God punishes them for that. And in a moment of punishment, we have to imagine this happened. These people were dragged away from their homes, separated from their families often, to a foreign land. And God says, in the midst of that, I'll take a sprig and I can build a grander kingdom than you'd know than the one who's taking you away. There is always mercy for God in the midst of his judgment, mercy that will overcome the momentary judgment. But second, for the exile, there's hope. When we see nations or the church or Israel or the world seem to be in demise or to be in decay, the lesson for Ezekiel is do not rely on what appearances show you, but live by hope. I can make a grand branch out of which all a tree, out of which all the birds of the air and of the earth will come and, and gather. That passage is important. Uh, today it's paired with Mark chapter 4 because scholars agree that Mark has paired it or drawn upon it, or Jesus has, in the telling of his second parable in our reading. But Mark's reading in chapter 4 actually has three parables, and they all relate to seeds. And our reading only deals with two of them. The first is an image of a sower who goes out and he sows his seed on the field. And he goes to sleep and he awakes day after day. And behold, that the and he knows not how, but a great crop comes, and the earth produces seed and harvest on its own. 
You know, Israel was an agricultural nation, and we have farmers and gardeners that all know that the seed doesn't produce on its own. It has to be sown carefully. It has to be weeded and protected. It has to be watered and nurtured. It has to be um, um, sown and also brought out at the right time. And it's not meant to diminish the parable, the efforts that go into farming. It's a reflection on the mystery of the growth of the seed. I tend to this tiny thing, and yet it becomes a crop that feeds a family, that feeds a city. These molecules we know now that diversify and multiply, that become food, that become these riches out of nearly nothing. And this is um, Jesus' own metaphor for the word. In the Gospels, you might be familiar, the seed is almost always the word of God, the good news, the gospel that goes about. And it goes about among the nations, and it's being sown. And we need not make the seed grow. We merely need to receive it and be faithful to it. Uh, Jesus then moves immediately to a second parable. Is not the kingdom of heaven like a mustard seed, the smallest of all the seeds, and yet when it grows up, it becomes a great mustard bush or tree that can gather and house the birds of the field? It is, you can hear the parallel to Ezekiel's parable about the great cedar tree in the spring. But Jesus has changed it to a mustard tree, and it's not clear exactly why. Maybe because the grandeur of a cedar, Israel, um, he's resisting the temptation to pride that Israel's going to be a great empire. A mustard bush has nothing on a great cedar. But the point is probably much more likely the fact that the, the, the great contrast between the size of a mustard seed and the mustard bush. Um, as I understand it, an orchid seed is smaller than a mustard seed, but an orchid's not that big compared to a mustard tree. It's that contrast between simple, a minuscule beginnings, and what kind of kingdom, what kind of grandeur, what kind of world can be made out of what seems to us to be nothing in our eyes. Three thoughts to take away from these proverbs and riddles and comparisons as we read them. There is something in them, in the reading of them, in the puzzling them out, that is meant to drive us to grasp lessons as we read them and interpret them. And the first is this, set not our eyes on empire and grandeur. That's the temptation for Israel, the the images of the eagle in Babylon and the eagle in Egypt. Israel was always looking to grander empires and comparing themselves to them. The bigger, the stronger the nation of Israel, they thought, the better the kingdom of God will be. And Israel, like Ezekiel, as the prophets all do, and Jesus does, critiques this idea of seeking out empires. I'm aware at this moment of the tendency and maybe it's always been true through history, to be either critical or in desperate um, hope for the church, right? The church is in exile. It's in persecution and small. How could it ever be great? Or in our day, the, the church runs global, this massive colonial system, and it gets full of hypocrisy. And in both conditions, we wonder, how could the kingdom of God be in the midst of that? And the lesson from these two is don't look at the empires, don't look at the power of the system, but at the Lord who builds them, who builds his kingdom. So the second lesson is related to that, and it actually comes in the New Testament reading in 2 Corinthians 5 that we read today, where Paul says at the beginning in verse 7, walk by faith and not by sight. Right, that's the inclination. This is why Israel's panicking in the day of exile. They see themselves drawn away from their home. Or as Mark, who writes this letter, this gospel, to a church who's small and under persecution, do not live by sight. Your little tiny church that Mark writes to, that lives in its own day, manifests the power of a seed to bring forth the kingdom. Live by faith and not by sight. Faith, as I try to emphasize throughout the year, is a virtue. It's a gift that's given to us, like courage or strength or temperance or prudence, these kinds of things. But faith is a unique, it's a supernatural gift of believing and holding fast to something in a way that brings forth obedience. And we practice faith. 
It's not something we simply have and it, go, and, it, and it lives forever in us. We come together, especially as a community, we proclaim, we recite the words of our faith, we confess our sins together and renew that faith. That weekly, frequent, daily discipline of being faithful gives us that kind of virtue of walking by faith and not by sight, of resisting the temptation to look at the world and be in despair. The third lesson would be this. Receive the word of God, the seed, with great joy. Meditate on it, puzzle over it, interpret it, and spread it abroad. The word in the midst of the gospel is that fruit. It's this message of the good news. It's the parables and the allegories and the riddles and the stories that we give ourselves to as Christians. And I challenged us with this. How much of your work in giving yourself daily to reading and listening to these scriptures have you participated in? How much formation have you experienced by reading in Kings and Psalms and Mark and Paul and trying to interpret, and giving yourself to the seed, believing that God can make something of it. And as it fills you up, you become a sower of the seed. This is Jesus' point of his parable. Those who become faithful receivers and doers of the word may spread the seed abroad. So I pray for us now in this season, as we're on the cusp of gathering again together, that we set our eyes on the kingdom of God and not on the empire's and hopes of the world, that we walk by faith and not by sight, that we receive the word with great joy in our hearts and spread it abroad. And we pray to the Lord that he would bear fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold in our midst. Amen.